I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at National Instruments with David Hall, who's going to talk today about how 5G affects test. So David, 5G is a brand new world, even though people think that we've come out of the 4G and 3G and everything is, is the same. What changes from a test perspective? Yeah, there's a lot of things that change. I think one of the things I want to kind of focus on here is really some of the infrastructure components that are changing really architecturally. The, the move from kind of singular large macro cell to smaller cell type base station architectures and even massive MIMO technology is really changing the design requirements and the test requirements around a lot of the semiconductor devices that are going into base stations. So does this require entirely new equipment? Does it require new, new techniques for doing it? What changes? Yeah, in many cases, the, the test techniques are similar, the measurements are similar, uh, but it, it does create an opportunity to use different equipment um, than you would use in the past. I think one of the best examples of that is we're seeing a lot of companies move from really these kind of do-it-yourself, build-your-own, rack-and-stack type testers um, with a lot of signal conditioning around the instruments into more of an ATE type architecture. Why don't you draw this out for us? Sure. So David, what are we looking at here? Well, one of the things I wanted to kind of start with is sort of the problem statement of how you get data to users in a cell phone network and the way that's changing. So you can imagine a base station, here's its kind of radius of areas that it can serve, and here's some different user equipment, I'll call them UEs for user equipment. These are devices that are receiving that signal. Well, historically, the way that you would develop this system would be to have omnidirectional antennas where you distribute power evenly across the cell. But one of the optimizations from an efficiency perspective as well as a range perspective is to use techniques like beamforming to direct energy to this particular device. Now the, the instances where that's really useful are scenarios where this device is at the band edge. Because instead of give it, getting a relatively low power signal, you can actually give it an amplified signal by directing more energy to that device. That's going to allow the device to use higher order modulation schemes, get better throughput, better quality of service. So that's sort of the fundamental problem that we're addressing um, in a lot of the cell networks. And you have a lot more of these than you did in the past too, right? Because the, the signals don't go as far, they fall off, they get interrupted. Yeah, and, and actually let's, let's kind of zoom into what, how this particular cell phone or that infrastructure equipment has changed architecturally, because that's actually driving a lot of the test requirements. So I'm actually going to erase this. Let's draw um, what might be a, a massive MIMO antenna array. So you might have a scenario, say you have 16 or 64 different antenna elements print it or as different antenna elements that together are going to be used to direct energy and you're actually using changes in phase between each of these elements to direct energy in one location versus the other. In fact you can think about that as doing beam forming. Now architecturally the signal chain behind this is changing as well. So in the past you might have a singular PA going to a singular antenna element. Um, and what's happened instead is when you switch to a massive MIMO type configuration, instead of a singular high power PA, you have a multitude of lower power devices that are each amplifying the signal simultaneously. So in, in the old days, in a 3G network, you might have a singular PA driving to an omnidirectional antenna. You go to a 5G scenario, you might have 16 or 64 PAs each driving separate elements of an antenna array. So how do you test all that? Well, the challenge with test is that the volumes of devices have, are changing. Now fortunately, that, that sounds like a problem, right? You have more, 64 times more devices to test. Fortunately, some of the test requirements are also changing as well because the power requirements are changing. So you can imagine here, if this is going to, um, if this is a one, a five watt uh, PA, in a massive MIMO scenario, you might have, if you, if you had 16 of these to get to the same effective power, you'd have to effectively multiply this to be an 80 watt PA, right? So instead of having a 80, singular 80 watt PA, you might have five, uh, a 16 5 watt PA. So the power levels are smaller as well. And that changes a lot of how you do testing. So if you look at a typical, and this is really, we'll call it the old school tester model. The old school tester, a lot of people would use a rack of instruments. So you have your signal analyzer, your signal generator, um, you might use a VNA, um, you'll use a, a power supply, uh, and, and the power supply would be used to turn the device on. Um, typically with a signal generator, 
a really good signal generator might get you to a watt of output power. So you, you might have, you know, at best case, plus 30 dBm of output power coming out here. And so if this is your device under test, you actually would have to gain up the signal going into that, that device under test to even get it to the right level to test this device. So in a typical scenario, you might also have a driver amp. It could be rack mount or otherwise. And this signal generator actually goes into the driver amp. You go from the driver amp into the, into the device under test. From there, you go to a massive attenuator. Uh, these things just look like a big heat sink uh, because of the heat dissipated at that, those high power levels. And then you go from that massive attenuator back into the signal analyzer. Does it change because now you have multiple antennas, so you have to think of this not just a device under test, but really a system under test? Okay, there's also, in addition to the amplifier having changing test requirements, there's also a lot of the other components being tested that also have changing requirements as well. So, for example, um, a lot of the, the transceivers that are driving the amplifier have switched from discrete components to more, more increasing digital. Uh, but I want to kind of share with this type of scenario how it changes when you get to a massive MIMO situation. So all of this signal conditioning around the drive ramp and the attenuator is necessary in a traditional sense because of the power requirements of this type of device. What's happening today is that when you move from small volumes of extremely high power devices to large volumes of smaller power devices, you actually start testing it on more of a traditional ATE. Let's see if my drawing skills are correct here. Um, but now you're, you have a scenario where you have a load board and you may be doing uh, single, dual, or even quad site testing where you're placing uh, those PAs into a load board on top of a traditional um, ATE. And the benefit of doing that is not only does the engineer not have to manage some of the signal conditioning that you'd have to deal with calibration and all of those issues in the past, but you can also deal with some of the volume and the, uh, you can benefit from the volumes and the manipulator integration, the handle integration that you get out of a traditional ATE. There are a lot of iterations of this. Vendors are doing their own take on 5G. It's varying from country to country. What are some of the architectural changes that you have to contend with? Yeah, so I think one of the things that we're, we're seeing change over time is th there's an increasing amount of integration that we're seeing at the packaging level with getting as much potential functionality into this single device. So if you kind of just draw it out, right, in a typical signal chain, you have, um, I'll, I'll draw my kind of DAX and ADC, so my converters. Um, these aren't the best converters. They should look like baseball home plates, right? Um, Right, so I have my DAX and ADCs, right, there's my transceiver, um, that would go to an amplifier which goes to an antenna um, or potentially goes to a um, beam former and then an antenna, right? So you have this increasingly complex signal chain and the way that chip makers are intending to address this both from a cost and power performance point of view is to integrate as much of that functionality into single chips as possible. So we talked a little bit previously about the amplifiers, right? So you're seeing this already on the mobile side where um, we see chip makers integrating multiple amplifiers meant to handle different bands into single chips as front end modules. So instead of having single dis PA, discrete devices, you're seeing 16, 16 port uh, front end modules that handle amplifiers, uh, LNAs, switches, filters, all integration in, into the same package. We're also seeing the same thing at the transceiver point as well. Um, in, in the past, a lot of this kind of transceiver portion was discrete components. You might have discrete DACs, discrete ADCs, discrete modulator as separate pieces, all of which had to be tested independently. What's happening is a lot of these are increasingly getting integrated into the single package. And so it actually changes some of the test requirements as well. Now, instead of just dealing with the RF and baseband, you have high-speed serial interfaces going into the chip. So I think the overall summary is that there's a lot of increasing complexity with RF devices as we're increasing the number of port count, but also increasing digital requirements as we try to pack more and more functionality into the chip. So as you get through all these tests, is one of your big concerns still coverage? One of the biggest concerns is coverage. And I think, in fact, one of the things that we continue to look at as National Instruments is, is methods to actually 
maintain test coverage without increasing the test cost, right? And there's, there's kind of two approaches to do that. One of which is sort of the brute force technique. We're just gonna measure as fast as possible. We'll come up with whatever optimizations we can do to use the measurements as, fa as fast as we possibly can and get through test coverage very quickly. The other mechanism, and one that we're actually looking at is techniques like artificial intelligence, where you can actually look at, if, if we pass one condition, then we're always gonna pass the other condition. I can get the same t test coverage by actually doing a fewer number of overall measurements. And that's another method longer term that I think we're going to use to improve the test coverage without actually increasing the test costs. David Hall, thanks for a great explanation. Thanks for, uh, glad to be with you.